Hello. In this video, we are going to derive some important relationships using Euler's formula. Recall that if we have a complex number z, and in the form e to the i x, that using Euler's identity, Euler's formula, we can write it as cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. So we notice that the argument of the cosine or the sine function is just the number x that's multiplied by the imaginary number in the exponent. Now suppose we look at the number z star and z star represents what we call the complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate of a complex number we get simply by replacing i by minus i. So anywhere you see an i in the number, replace it by minus i. If we do that, again we can apply the formula as we've seen here, but now instead of having i multiplied by x, i is multiplied by minus x. So this ends up being cosine of x minus i sine of x. So we notice if we take our idea of forming the complex conjugate as replacing i by minus i, we've accomplished exactly the same thing in this particular representation. We took the plus i times sine x and we replaced it by minus i of sine x. So this is the complex conjugate. Now we'll actually show some interesting combination formulas that we can derive. Now suppose I decide to take e to the ix and add it to e to the minus ix. Now recall we can't simply combine these uh, because we're adding together two exponents, things with exponents, so we just can't add the exponents together. If we were multiplying e to the i x times e to the minus i x, then we would add exponents. But we can't simply add anything together here. So to do this particular addition, we have to first convert each of these terms into some sort of trigonometric identity using Euler's formula. So we already know that e to the i x is equal to cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. So this is the first term equal to that. Now we're going to add to that our representation for e to the minus i x. And we know the complex conjugate, that's going to be cosine of x minus i sine of x. And we've been careful to add the to line the terms up so that it'll make our addition easier later on. So now we notice a couple of things. One is that our plus i sine of x and our minus i sine of x add together simply equals zero. So we can drop that out. And we're left with cosine x plus cosine x equals two times the cosine of x. So we bring down what we have on the left-hand side, we see that e to the i x plus e to the minus i x is equal to 2 times the cosine of x. And we can do one thing further. We can divide each side by 2. So if we do that, we can divide this side by 2 and this side by 2. We notice that the 2's on the right hand side will cancel each other and we've actually come up with a new identity for the cosine of x. We've come up with a way of writing the cosine of x in terms of these exponentials. So let me just write this down in complete form. e to the ix plus e to the minus ix over 2 is equal to the cosine of x. So 
So we've come up with a very interesting and unusual way of rewriting the cosine function that we know and love from trigonometry. In terms of these exponential functions that involve imaginary numbers. Now that we have added together two exponential terms, let's see what we get if we subtract two exponential terms. So what I mean is this, if we have e to the ix and we subtract e to the minus ix here, what do we get? Well, first we know by using Euler's formula that e to the ix is going to be cosine of x plus i sine of x. We also know that if we replace e to the minus ix by what it represents, that's going to be cosine of x minus i sine of x. But we have to be careful here because we're subtracting these two terms, so I need to group this together because this is the entire term e to the minus ix, and you want to subtract. So if I do that, the first term stays exactly the same, so we get cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. But now if I take minus 1 times this term, I get minus cosine x minus times minus i is a plus i. So this term in green becomes minus cosine x plus i times the sine of x, where these are added together. It's addition. So now, in this particular case, I notice that the cosine of x and the cosine of x add together uh, equals zero. So that leaves the right hand side now being i times the sine of x plus i times the sine of x, which gives me 2i times the sine of x on the right hand side. And we notice on the left hand side, this is the e to the i x minus e to the minus i x. Okay. Now we can perform the same trick that we performed for the last example, and we can divide both sides, but now instead of dividing just by a 2, we want to divide by 2i. So we divide both sides by 2i. One thing I like to point out, if you've studied uh, imaginary numbers, particularly in an Algebra 2 type course, your teacher will probably have insisted that we're not allowed to put imaginary numbers in the denominator. Um, you're often told also that you're not allowed to put things like square roots in the denominators of fractions. In this particular course, and in most college and postgraduate courses, you're perfectly allowed to do that. So um, all those techniques that you used in Algebra 2 to rationalize the denominator, we often simply ignore in higher level work. So nice thing to do. So since we can cancel 2i with 2i, now we've actually developed an expression for the sine of x in terms of exponentials. So we see that our right hand side is simply the sine of x and our left hand side is now e to the i x minus e to the minus i x divided by 2i. And this is our new expression that we've derived for the sine function that we know and love. For the last two derivations in this video, we are simply going to generalize what we've done with the first two derivations. So, to show, suppose we want to add e 
to the ix plus b e to the minus ix. So now we put two different coefficients in front of our exponential functions. But we can handle it exactly as we'd expect because if we know what e to the ix is equal to, um, we just multiply each term uh, by the a in front. So since we know e to the ix is equal to cosine of x plus i times the sine of x, since it's multiplied by a, we simply put the a as the coefficient in front. Similarly, since we know e to the minus i x is going to be cosine of x minus i times the sine of x, we can simply put the coefficient in front. And let me even color code this just to remind us that that's what we're doing here. So I'll make the coefficient purple so we can put our purple b in front of each of the two terms. So this is completely mathematically legitimate to do so. So now we can add term by term. We notice that as far as our cosines of x, I have a cosine x plus b cosine of x. So that's a plus b as a quantity times the cosine of x. It's exactly what we would expect using ordinary algebra. And then we notice as far as the uh, sine of x, we have a i sine x minus b i sine of x. So we can add a minus b times i sine of x. So we're able to come up with a generic expression for this particular case. And one thing, once we highlight this, I want to highlight something for you. Whenever we derive a formula of this type, we always want to double check to make sure that it makes sense. So for example, we know that if A and B are both equal to one, we've already done that example, let's see what we get for our formula. Well, A plus B would be one, so that would be two cosine of X. A minus B would be one minus one would be zero. So this would reduce down to two cosine of X, which is exactly what we saw when we had e to the ix plus e to the minus ix, where the coefficients were implied to be 1. So therefore, this formula makes sense. So now let's do the uh, other example. And that's once at a times e to the ix. We color code this, take the a a green a here, and then plus or minus b e to the minus i x and we'll color code the coefficient as purple. So now we can write out what each of these is equal to. So remember e to the i x is cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. And let me put in the coefficients. We know that the has to be an A for each of these. And now <clears throat> we have minus E to the minus IX. So again, that's going to be cosine of X here. Minus I times the sine of X. Our coefficient is B but remember we have this entire quantity subtracted so I'm not going to show the intermediate step but you can double check uh, earlier in the video to see that this is true so we can actually simplify this particular expression and we see that as far as cosine of x goes that its coefficient is going to be a minus b.
So we have a minus b cosine of x. And now we need to have i sine x at the end here. And let's see what the appropriate coefficients are going to be. We have plus a i x minus a minus b. So that's going to be a plus b. So we see in this particular case, we have a minus b cosine of x plus a plus b i sine of x. And if you compare it to the previous example, we notice that the plus sign and the minus sign for the coefficient swap, which is exactly what we'd expect. So a plus b here, a minus b for the coefficient of the cosine of x. Here the coefficient is a minus b for i sine of x. Here the coefficient is a plus b i sine of x. And again, as one last check, we want to look at the example where a and b are both equal to 1 because we know what that is equal to. If we do that, this coefficient then becomes 1 minus 1, which is 0. So this term drops out. 1 plus 1 equals 2i sine of x, which is exactly what we had determined before in the case where we simply had e to the ix minus e to the minus ix. The formula that we've derived, or this formula, uh, let me write up here again, is true in general. But if we put some specific values into the formula, we notice that we get surprising results. And the most surprising result we are likely to get when we use the value that x equals pi. So we want to substitute the value of pi in for x into Euler's formula, and we'll see what we get in that case. So in that case, we have e to the i times pi. Sometimes this is written as e to the pi i, which doesn't make any particular difference. It's just how people often write. So now we simply substitute pi everywhere we saw x in the formula. So this tells us that this expression here is going to be equal to the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. So we've actually just substituted a specific value for x in the formula to show how we can evaluate the formula. Okay, so what does that give us? Well, e to the pi i. Well, the cosine of pi is minus 1. The sine of pi is 0. So that tells us that e to the pi i, this very strange expression where we have the base of natural logarithms, and we have, as an exponent, we have pi, which is a transcendental number, multiplied by the imaginary number. So we have three very strange numbers and a strange relationship on the left-hand side that, when we compute, are equal to minus 1. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a go.